So, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the 89th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. Uh, we are recording today's meeting, and if you do not wish to be recorded, uh, you should leave now. Um, as is the, the way of uh, us doing these things, uh, we tend not to uh, spend time on introductions. Uh, rather, we'd like you just to put your name and affiliation uh, and where you are in the chat in response to a message that Tim's putting in uh, so that we can update the agenda and Tim will uh, post the link to the agenda as well in the chat. So if you could make sure you've done that, that'd be great. Um, as, is always the case, as is also the case, we start with a short introduction to the group for anybody who has not joined us before. And I believe we do have one or two people who have not uh, joined us before. So welcome to, to the newcomers. I look forward to seeing everybody's names in the chat. To, uh, once uh, Nareet starts talking, I'll take a look. Um, however, as you can see by the presentation this month, uh, <laughs> it's a work in progress this month uh, because we are uh, realizing that our introductory presentation has is, is got long in the tooth and we're working on improving it. However, we didn't get finished. Uh, so hence the, uh, the notes on here. So uh, I will go through this uh, fairly fast and uh, be, be aware that next month, hopefully, there will be a much better version of what we're about to do. So uh, just to start with uh, an acknowledgement. Now, obviously, we're sitting here in Toronto, Canada, um, on the uh, lands of the, uh, but this is the first credit. Uh, however, uh, this is a global meeting. So we've adopted the land, the land acknowledgement to be, uh, to dis discuss uh, and to be useful to everybody around the world, hence the sustainable development goal on here. So wherever you are today, um, this is sacred land on which each of us are privileged to be. This land, the nearby lakes and sea, has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge, and tradition. And we're privileged to be the beneficiaries and stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come and beyond. And we invite you to consider in your place how you honor and respect in peoples indigenous to your place, including, of course, for many of you yourselves. Today, each place around the world is increasingly a home to people from across the world, and we're each grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. So this is an acknowledgement from a, a very much a social perspective um, and, and in a place, uh, but we also like to have a think about a bi biophysical recognition of where we are as well. So uh, we're actually the lower level of the building in the photograph on the right at the far end. Uh, and this is obviously Toronto on a rather sunnier day than it is today here. Um, and so we like to start with this question. Do you know what watershed you're in? Answers in the chat, please. Bow River Basin, excellent. So here in Toronto, uh, obviously we're near Lake Ontario, but more specifically, we're on the edge of a watershed known by settlers as Russell Creek. Uh, that was buried uh, in the mid 1870s because we polluted it so badly. Uh, I've been looking for the indigenous names for it and haven't managed to find them yet. So if anybody can help me with that, I would be very happy to get them. Um, and just in terms of a practical aspect, the watershed that you are sitting in, whether it's here in the room or wherever you are, um, is actually something you're dependent on for your ability to participate in this session. If you visit the bathroom before or after uh, we started, it's actually the watershed that powers that system that we use, uh, that ecosystem service. So we are very directly connected on the environment, if, if that's uh, hopefully a reasonable example. And for those of you using the Flourishing Business Canvas, um, this watershed is a collection of vital biophysical stocks and solar powered ecosystem services on which we're all interdependent. And this is, of course, why. Uh, those two boxes appear on the flourishing business canvas. So uh, we are, oh my goodness, we've added 40 people in the last month. Uh, so we are now approaching 1800 people worldwide, um, practitioners, researchers, and students. Um, uh, we are the first, world's first, perhaps the world's only group taking action to undertake enterprise strategy and to do organizational design action research from a micro-ecological economic perspective. So we're not macro-ecological economists, we're micro-ecological economists. We use anticipatory systemic design science approaches, uh, both in our research and in our practice. Uh, we have a strong normative pur purpose, which we're not afraid of talking about, unlike most educational uh, and other institutions. We, our purpose, our goal, is to enable the possibility for flourishing 
after John Ehrenfeld and also a lot of feminist literature I'm now discovering. So hopefully you've found yourself amongst friends. I won't go through all this. Um, I wanted to just highlight to everybody uh, that um, we're very, very happy about the UN 75th uh, anniversary this year because the Secretary General uh, of the United Nations, rather than uh, suggesting that there should be a celebration, since he's observed that we really have nothing to celebrate, um, he's called for a year of reflection instead. Um, and uh, this reflection is very, very aligned with the direction that we've been suggesting. So he's, what the Secretary General uh, Ontario, Ontario, uh, Ontario, Antonio Guterres is uh, asking everybody to do is reflect on what is humanity's purpose? What is the future that we want? And um, I recommend that you all go online uh, and do the survey if you haven't already and tell the Secretary General we want the possibility to flourish. That's what we want as our highest purpose. And um, so I'll leave it at that. If you want an example of what to do, uh, these slides are in the uh, Google Drive for this month so you can get the uh, Twitter link there. Okay, we are also evolving to become uh, the Flourishing Enterprise Institute. So we've been a voluntary group since 2012. Uh, we're moving to a uh, funded planetary-wide network of nodes forming a Flourishing Enterprise Institute. There are a couple of the node leaders on the call today, and there will continue to be a practice, uh, a research and practice community, a practice and research community associated with that, which is what the SSPMG is going to evolve in. Uh, Randy, are you on the call? No. Um, so um, I'm the acting director of um, practice and research for the Institute, and Randy Sarden is not here today, is the acting director, uh, is the acting uh, executive director for the Institute. So I won't talk any more about this. Uh, so we have Tim and Laurie helping us uh, as first as community animators. So Tim is in here in the room uh, with me in Toronto, and Laurie is in um, Calgary. I won't go through any of this. Uh, we have a lot of people that we're working with, and uh, so there's a logo chart in here. If you're not familiar with all of these folks, I highly recommend you get to know uh, all of them. Uh, we, Bob on my left here is uh, uh, working amongst many other things on the Future Fit Business Benchmark, and many of us are working on many of the things here. Um, obviously, we're in sync with the SDGs. Uh, we have lots of things going on, which we're working on improving our uh, Wikipedia site. To describe, you notice the number of logos on here is going up, and that's very much by design. And in fact, today we may add another logo as a result of today's meeting. We'll, we'll see where the conversation takes us. Okay, and I think I'm going to leave it at that for this month, because we're running behind. Yes. Okay, lots of other interesting things in this presentation. Not the best presentation at the moment, but we are, like everything else, working on improving things. So let me stop sharing. Uh, let me make sure, Nareen, that you can sh uh, share uh, the list here. You should be able to share, Nareen. Okay. Let's see how that works. So uh, while Nareen's um, just getting uh, connected, um, I just wanted to uh, say a, a couple of words about Nareen and, and how she and I met and uh, why we invited her to come and talk this, this month. So uh, Nareen and I were introduced through one of the initiatives uh, of the members of this group, the Andrew Flourish Project, and the then executive director of that project, uh, Claire Summer, said to me, I don't know, Nareen, how long ago was it? Probably four years ago now. I think something like that we figured out. Yeah, it yeah. seems like yesterday, but I think... Yeah, it seems like yesterday, but it was actually four or five years ago. Um, and so Nareesh and I have been corresponding, chatting, uh, watching each other's Facebook feeds and, and other things since then, and uh, really found that we had a lot, lot in common. And then completely by chance, and Bob was actually there at the same time, we were at a conference organized by another member of this group, the, international, the first international conference on sustainable entrepreneurship, which was in Montreal, last August, and lo and behold, I see Nareet in the flesh for the first time, and she sees me in the flesh. And then Nareet gives this um, wonderful presentation, and I won't say anything more about that, uh, on the topic of um, if we're serious about enabling strongly sustainable enterprises, flourishing enterprises, thriving enterprises, we're going to have to change the education uh, that's provided to the people leading and managing those educational uh, institutions and uh, those education for those enterprises, and that means a very significant shift in what gets taught in the professional education world. And of course, most of that is business school. So Nareet has spent the last eight years now, Nareet, six, seven years, something like this, 
Uh, you know, they, I graduated, I, I, my PhD is from 10 years ago, and even before that, I was teaching or part of a business school because I was part of the PhD program for at least another five years before that or six years before that. So it's been a while. <laughs> so, so, it's, so Narita is, is um, developed a, a, a growing and deep expertise and community around what should the future's uh, strongly sustainable business school curriculum look like. Um, and so we want to, obviously that's a key part of what we're trying to do here, bring, bringing this about in reality. So we need a supply of people who are trained and knowledgeable about all the things that we all know uh, around strong and sustainable business. So uh, Narit is, is going to share with us her current thinking um, and very much in, as with all of our presentations at the group, um, we're looking for people who are interested in, in getting involved in this. Perhaps this will be another initiative of the group. Um, and I'll let that develop as the conversation unfolds. So, Marie, enough from me, over to you. Thank you, Anthony. And after your introduction, I, I knew this uh, going in, but uh, you reinforced it that I, I know I'm among friends here uh, because I think you'll see that what I'm here to talk about, um, it, it well, firstly, it's very much a work in progress. So I'm happy to have a discussion. I, I don't have the definitive answers to any of this, and I don't think anyone does today. But I think, um, I feel like I'm among friends because I think that we're all in the same space of um, knowing that we need to create or kind of, uh, uh, I'd like to call it leading from the outside. And that's not my, I saw that recently. I think it was Stacey Abrams who um, ran for governor of Georgia. She wrote a book called Leading from the Outside. And I think that's what we're all doing here. So these are not definitive answers, but these are definitely my own thoughts on how we can and need to change the curriculum. I am coming from a business school, per, kind of a business school perspective, because that's what I'm familiar with. Although I think I've evolved a little bit beyond that. So, you know, you'll see as, as I'm talking what I mean by that. So these are some of my thoughts about what a, what potentially a curriculum that really will help us get to that flourishing future might look like. And I believe it, it has evolved quite a bit and it will continue to evolve quite a bit. I, I do want to just say my background is that for a while I was the director of a, an MBA program at a local college here in Cleveland. Um, I called it a socially conscious program. Um, although I've evolved beyond that. Today I'm calling my program an ecological leadership program. And I'll explain a little bit why that has changed. So uh, I'll just guess launch into this. So this is really about asking questions. And I have a lot more questions than I do have answers. And I think that that's where we all are today and that's what we have to acknowledge. So I will be ans asking questions throughout my presentation, come to a few um, maybe overarching questions at the end, but throughout I'll have questions. And if I'm not asking the right questions, which is possible, I would love to hear from you if you have other thoughts about which questions I and all of us should be asking. Um, so, so to be honest, and we all know this, the world is burning or flooding or disease is spreading, whichever one. <laughs> um, so one of the questions that has to be asked um, when you look around the world is what is the point of going to school? And I, I kind of asked that question um, a little bit, both as a mother of two children who are currently in 10th grade and 7th grade, and also as someone who, um, so I have two hats going on. The other one is my, of course, uh, hat as an academic, as someone in, in higher education, although currently I am a, the, um, the co-director of a nonprofit called Lake Erie Institute. And that's what I mean by leading from the outside, because Lake Erie Institute is not a traditional Institute of Higher Education. We are a nonprofit and we are doing something that's maybe can't yet be done within the walls of, of academia today. I don't think universities are nimble enough or um, able to change enough in order to embrace what I think where we, I think we need to go. So um, as I was saying, I was a director of a business school program but I couldn't make the changes that I wanted to within that uh, framework. And now outside of it, as a director of a nonprofit, I can do things a lot more, well, I can be a little bit more bold or maybe a lot more bold. Um, so my question about what's the point of going to school, I think the Greta Thunberg generation and the school strikes 
are asking that question. I think that they're saying to us, and this is the generation that are now coming up in the world and, and soon to be going to universities, are saying, what are you talking about? We need to address climate change. We need to address what's going on in the world. It's more important than actually getting the degree. What's the point of getting that degree? What's the point of even going to school? When the skill set that we're training or teaching students is not the one that potentially is, is even going to meet our needs in the future. Um, and it's interesting because those of us, of course, follow higher education know that um, probably 20 to 30, 40 years ago, um, universities were much more seen as a place to, um, uh, to, to learn critical thinking, to um, uh, maybe to uh, indulge your uh, intellectual curiosity. Whereas today, the answer to what is the point of going to school is much more about being trained for a job in the world. And I'm gonna question a lot of that. Those, those things I think need to be questioned. So when I talk about skill sets, that's because today's university is all about training someone with the right skill sets to, um, to go out into the job market. But of course, if the future job market is one that we can't predict, then what's the point, what, are, we, are we even, you know, are we beginning to meet that need if that is the need of what higher education really is all about, which of course I think we need to question as well. So um, these are some of my basic assumptions. And I think that they are assumptions that all need to be questioned. But the, and, and again, I, I, I wanna say that these questions, a lot, most of them come from a business school perspective. So you understand that, but they're not, they're not all from a business school perspective. I mean, the, the number one assumption that humans are on top of the pyramid and that we're in the Anthropocene, which is, of course, um, um, I'm assuming most of you understand that concept of uh, man, you know, humans being the center or the top of that pyramid. That's what the Anthropocene is, and that's what we've been living in. I, I think we've been living in it for over 2,000 years since Protagoras uh, came out with the... Um, the quote that we all know is man is the measure of all things. That was, um, that's Protagoras in ancient Greece in 500, 400 something BCE. So I think we've been in that space for a very, very long time, but we are now obviously hitting the limits or past all the limits to what that means. So, um, and I do believe that it is almost any, and you could, those of you who come from different uh, disciplines might uh, be able to uh, fill in. I can't, of course, um, um, speak to every single discipline, but certainly the business school discipline, discipline is that humans are on top of that pyramid and are, are center of all of it. Uh, number, the second assumption is that we are each of us separate from everyone else and separate from nature. Um, and I put in parentheses, although in reality, we are part ape and part swarm. And what I mean by part, and it's funny, it's because this coronavirus, which uh, is such a, uh, it's such a remarkable exercise. You know, what we're seeing now is, is such a, it's almost like if, if something out there in the universe wanted to show us how much we are all one, how much we are all part swarm, really swarm like an ant swarm or bees in a hive, um, I can't think of anything that could show it better than this uh, this virus that we are now all very much uh, you know focused on. Um, we humans are are just we, we are we we are like apes, but we are also like that swarm, and um, and and that is one of the assumptions that the, the one of the assumptions that is flawed is that we are separate from everyone else or separate from nature, and yet we are being shown over and over that that is not true, that we are actually all interconnected. Um, another assumption is that environment is something that's out there and we exploit the environment or nature for our own ends and needs. Another assumption is, now I'm moving a little bit from, the, those are kind of related, those first three, but um, as we move along, um, a few other assumptions that come to mind. Again, these are this is not an exhaustive list by any means. Um, but it's up to the individual to succeed independently in the world. And that is something that certainly has um, become more, um, 
a more critical assumption, I think, in the last few years, at least certainly since neoliberal capitalism has become the main economic driver since the 80s, 1980s. Another one is knowledge is property and should be cordoned off, cordoned off right? Um, and that's an interesting one because for a while I was uh, teaching business ethics. And one of the things that comes up in all the business ethics textbooks is how much um, when you steal knowledge or you steal information or even um, even the, well the concept of stealing information is, is questionable but if you um, if you share a file or something that uh, or a movie or, or music you are stealing and this becomes an, uh, an ethical um, uh, something that's uh, to, to be uh, used as an example in ethics but of course that, that needs to be questioned again, because is knowledge really property and should it be um, treated as property in that way in, um, is something that we need to question. These are assumptions that we need to question in my opinion. Um, of course, businesses externalizing costs is another one that is every single industry in the world, every single discipline within a business school um, curriculum assumes that businesses can and should continue externalizing costs. That is what economics is all about in our current society, in our current uh, way of thinking. Uh, the idea of money and grades as measures of success. The idea that we must work for an income. I mean, can't we question that as well? Uh, and that will connect to my last one here too. Markets and technology will solve all our health problems, all our environmental problems and societal problems. Um, Anyway, I don't need to read all of these, but there may be other, other, I'm sure there are other assumptions that you all will probably think of also as you, I'm, I'm assuming that most of the people in this group are coming from different disciplines, not just business. But um, these are the assumptions that I've at least come up with that, that I think all need to be questioned because they're all very inherent within our current educational um, system. No, really? um, Sorry, yeah, I'd love to hear some feedback. Anyone? Have yeah, I, I, I remember you asked for this when you, you, you shared some of this in Montreal. Um, mm -hmm. how, how close to being sufficient do you think this list is at the moment? It's obviously necessary. Yeah, well, I, I think there's a lot more. <laughs> I actually, uh, like I said, I'm coming at it very much as a business school professor, and that's why, you know, when I talk about businesses externalizing costs, but I would love to hear from others who, who are, I mean, I, I actually have a, a, an undergrad degree and a, and a master's degree in English literature, and I sometimes try to put on that hat as I'm thinking about these things, too. Um, it's funny, I, I'm thinking of all the times that I was asked when I was getting my degrees in English literature the question was always, but what are you going to do with that degree? And um, the assumption behind that is, of course, that is not a useful degree for get, making a living afterwards once you finish. Um, so, of course, um, that already implies that, you know, that we're getting a degree, that any higher education is all about training you for the job course. It also really implies that what they're really asking is, how are you going to make money for a corporation? I mean, sure, I'll get paid something, but really, how is it that my degree is going to be valuable to a corporation? Uh, you know, all those things are, are here. Um, so even when I was studying English literature, which of course is also about humans, um, maybe Anthropocene, I, I don't know, it, it's, it's, it comes out a little different, but it, it's still, these assumptions still kind of work. Now, businesses externalizing costs may not have anything to do with English literature, I don't know. But if there's any other thoughts that come to mind as I'm speaking, as Narata. you all are thinking, I would love to hear. Narata, in yeah. Calgary, the tech sector has been talking quite strongly about uh, uh, education as a pillar in, in how we're creating a new economy here. And one of the big topics that's coming up is that that the education system is failing because it's way behind in terms of the information and knowledge that it provides to people that the workplace actually needs right now. Mm -hmm. So the, the uh, consensus seems to be here in Calgary is that an education, a formal education isn't required. People are hiring um, 
employees based on what, what their soft skills are because they can teach their own, those new employees the skills that they need on the fly and on the job. Right. And that's, it's nice to hear that. And on the other hand, it still falls within the assumption that education is for getting a job. Um, even if uh, it may not be, um, it may not be about teaching you certain skills that then you'll need in the job because the job is saying, okay, we'll train you. But there's still that assumption. There's still that we have to work for an income. There's still that we can't afford a social contract that might meet our basic needs for food, clothing, and shelter and healthcare without um, you, you, the, the, the whole concept. I, I'm not the first one talking about the whole concept of wage slavery. Uh, this is a, and, and I'll, I'll jump a little bit to those that talk about the universal basic income as um, a solution to some of this because it might really uh, de-link in a lot of ways um, working for a living and making a living, meaning being able to live without being a slave to wages. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it's good that, that the, um, the job market today is seeing other things besides, you know, coming out with certain skill set, but it's still very much about a pipeline. Does that make sense? Yeah. Maybe I can add another uh, possible point that could be there too for the uh, current corporate uh, model. And that is that the purpose of the corporation, according to Milton Friedman, is to maximize shareholder wealth. Yeah, yeah. Right. And last summer that was uh, called into question by yeah. Business Roundtable, which generated some interesting discussion. But they were really talking about the purpose of the corporation being to maximize stakeholder well-being. Right. That's a dramatically different lens on why the corporation is there, which leads to what the purpose of the education system is right. relative to the purpose of the corporation. Right. And, um, although you're, you're talking about education, providing people with the job skills they need to get a job, working for a company or a corporation, it, it also needs to provide them with the ability to sustain themselves. Yeah. Whether that's through a job or something else or through an income which is guaranteed or something, but they, they need to be able to make a living yeah. um, and make sure that they understand that there's some give and take in how they, they do that. Right. Um, and, and yeah, I, I do remember that that round table, that, that is a, a sea change. It's a, it's a huge shift when you think about it from you know, shareholder value to stakeholder value. And it's, it's definitely in the right direction, but I think that it's even going to be shaking up even more, especially with automation. Um, when, when there are fewer and fewer possibilities for making that living through uh, work, because work has now become automated more and more, um, in a lot of ways it shouldn't be feared, it should be freeing. I mean, we really are freeing ourselves from the whole concept of work work itself is changing so much so education has to change too in response or i, I don't know which is the, ch the chicken or the egg here i mean um education can you know they, they both need to change because um because there may be a delinking of those two things anyway of education and, and the workforce um i see that coming so it, it's interesting we are and then of course climate change is such a wild card I mean, who's to say even that there's going to be, I mean, there's such disruptions coming, there's such social societal disruptions coming that it's possible that the most important work will, any of us will, ever, will, will need to do is, is being able to grow our own food, basically. So, I mean, I think we have to prepare for that reality too. I think some of us are seeing that, um, that it may be, we have to go back to being very local very much about self-sufficiency, about being able to live in a community and, that can provide for itself. And I think the societal disruptions that are coming with climate change might be leading us towards that kind of a future. I, I think it's something that we have to take into consideration, which would change everything about the way society is structured. Does anyone wanna respond to that? Because it is kind of a big statement. <laughs> I, I, I think, Nareen, 
I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I've been listening over the last two or three weeks to Jen Bendel's Deep Adaptation uh, podcasts, and um, that there's obviously a lot of denial going on at the moment for many, many different reasons, not least of which is self-preservation mentally. Yeah. Um, and, um, I, I, and so as an example of that, while I agree with you that the shift that the business business council, I always forget the name of the group, but business round table, business round table thank you, uh, put out last year, um, it's not hard to see how it's self-serving right. uh, in terms of really serving the shareholders right. uh, because it's all just part of the changing definition of financial viability that's going on. And if you don't do some of what they're talking about, you'll actually cease to be financially viable. Um, and, uh, but, but are they doing it for, so, so uh, I've seen some people questioning their motivation. Yeah. I don't care about their motivation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 but the problem is that they're not gonna go fast enough. Yeah. If, if, they, wait for, if they wait for social convention to catch up uh, to, to what we need social convention to be, they're, they're, they should be leading rather than following. That's, that's my, my concern. So I, I think these assumptions are, are trying to get out there in front, right? They're trying to, to the best of our ability, say, if we, you know, sit, I don't know, 2030, maybe 2025, and we're, we're sitting in a world-class business school at that point, then if these aren't the assumptions that are underpinning the education of the people in that room at that time, um, then... You know, we really have, <laughs> it's another sign, let's put it that way. Right. You know, I, I, I really should should have this as a table and have the current assumptions and then how we need to shift mm -hmm. to other assumptions. Mm -hmm. But it's not so easy to, it, it's sort of, it's almost an exercise in, uh, in, I mean, it's not an easy exercise to do that kind of shift. Uh, it may be to a what if, what if we could shift from one thing to another. So maybe I'll move forward in the slides because I will tell you how Lake Erie Institute, how I've sort of um, responded to some of these questions and some of these assumptions with um, what we're, we've been doing at Lake Erie Institute. And then maybe we'll come back to a kind of broader view of, of education as a whole. So these are some of my own ideas, um, how we can create that curriculum that reflects that interbeing, interconnection rather than separation. So these are the topics. Now, again, um, these topics, ecological economics, eco-psych, regenerative practices, and economic entrepreneurship, and I'll explain what each one of these um, are in a minute, but they're not really separate from one another. So unlike a typical curriculum at a university, I, I don't see these really, I mean, it's not like I have a course in each one of these. Um, the entire program, so right now I'm running a program, we're just starting it, now that is, um, it's starting actually next week in March 20th on the spring equinox, um, a, a year long program, a 12 month program in which um, we are offering students. And again, I'm, I'm changing a lot of things here. So I'm not even really calling our participants students because I, uh, and I will talk about, I have a separate slide on this because part of what I'm trying to shift is also the whole hierarchy of, of a classroom setting of an educational system where you know there's a professor who knows everything and then is pouring knowledge supposedly into the heads of the students um, that's not how I even like think of education anymore I think that each person who walks into the room has a piece of the knowledge that we all need to share with one another and the role of the professor of the facilitator, I'm going to call now a facilitator rather than a professor, is to hold the container rather than to be the purveyor of knowledge. I'll talk a little bit more about this because I actually am jumping ahead in my slides because I want to talk about these four topics. Um, and like I said, they're not separate from one another. But the reason I chose these, so ecological economics, I have a really good quote here that I want to share. This is George Monbiot, who's worth reading if you um, haven't yet discovered him. But um, he says, when you, when you hear something that makes economic sense, this means it makes the opposite of common sense. Let me see if I can. <laughs> Those sensible men and women who run the world's treasuries and central banks, who see an indefinite rise in consumption as normal and necessary, 
and Anthony, I think that this speaks to those same business roundtable people because they are definitely among these, are berserkers. They are smashing through the wonders of the living world, destroying the prosperity of future generations to sustain a set of figures that bear even less relation to general welfare. And um, he goes on to say, green consumerism, material decoupling, sustainable growth, all are illusions designed to justify an economic model that is driving us to catastrophe. The current system based on private luxury and public squalor will immiserate us all. Under this model, luxury and deprivation are one beast with two heads. And he goes on to say, we need a, a different system. So, so my first thinking in, in ecological economics is firstly to understand how destructive the current classical mainstream economic system really is. I, I often say this, but we don't even usually examine our economic system because it's so much, I, I'm, I'm figuring present company might be accepted, uh, uh, might be excluded here from, from this statement, but, but I think the average uh, person who, you know, doesn't think about this kind of stuff doesn't think that we are the oxygen, you know, you don't think about the oxygen you're breathing or the, if you're a fish, the water you're swimming in, whichever metaphor you, you prefer to use. Um, and, and that is what our economic system is. It is the oxygen. And so my first uh, goal is to um, unveil it for the participants who come in, because I really think it's important to understand a, both the dark, I call it going into the dark sometimes. We, you know, le leading my students into, or the participants, um, into the darkness of our current um, reality. Um, and economics is not just economics, it's really where uh, ecology, ecological economics specifically is about how it's where uh, the intersection of ecology and psychology, anthropology, archaeology, history, sociology, I you know, haven't even mentioned everything here, but they all meet. That's what economics is really about, in my opinion. Um, and we really do need to be able to examine carefully and to be able to see clearly how we've we humans have been interacting with the environment in the past, and of course, how we might change that in the future. Uh, we are embedded in the ecological life support systems, we're not separate from the environment, and we do need to be thinking about a future that cares not just for all humans, but also for all, all of life on this planet, the web of life. And that's where we're shifting from that Anthropocene to a, um, to, to, to the inter interbeing with the web of life. So it's very important firstly to unveil, to me at least, um, why we're in this destructive place, why we are in this kind of um, cycle where, where we're really, uh, I mean, I've used this also as a metaphor, we're heading towards a cliff and we're really speeding towards it, we're not stopping. So um, that's what, to me, ecological economics is all about our connection with the with, um, with our world. Um, it doesn't stop. Like like I said, I don't start teaching that and then stop and then go on to teach something else. Or you know, it it, it becomes part of the ongoing conversation. And I think it gets unveiled slowly. It takes a while to really understand how deep. Um, the the destruction that we we've been you know um, perpetrating on our um, on our world goes so it's an ongoing kind of um, understanding and I do it through uh, in this case uh, you know we we read texts together we have discussions um, conversations dialogue it goes on um, like that and. So, so Narika, I, I wanted to thank you for including this slide in this topic. Um, you, you've just uh, brilliantly outlined why we call ourselves microecological economists in this room. Mm. You, you, you've just framed it beautifully. So we'll be we'll be stealing that idea and putting it into the, into the background because we we actually don't have anything written down that says what you've just said. Uh, so it's that's that's very helpful. Thank you. Oh, well, I'm glad. I have a lot written about it, so I'm happy to share whatever you need for that. I think it's an important topic, and I think it's almost, um, it's, it's crucial. But of course, it's, it's my own framing. And again, uh, that's why I'm saying I have more questions than answers. Um, 
someone else might approach this completely differently, but this happens to be, again, my background and, and, and where I'm coming from. So I think that this is important. Um, it, it, I don't have the definitive answers here, but this is the way I've designed, or we in, at Lake Erie Institute have designed the program. So let me go back to the next one. So once, so eco-psychology is, uh, yeah, yeah it, it continues that conversation on a, a somewhat different level. It is a contemporary movement, okay? It's where psychology, um, so it's psychology and environmental thought. And here, um, I'm not the one who um, is the expert on this particular topic. It's my uh, co-director who brings this in. And she's been um, sitting in nature. She says uh, all of the answers that she understands comes to her just simply by sitting in nature and bringing others out there too. Um, so it's an intentionally, intentionality in connecting with the natural world. It definitely increases physical, psychological, and spiritual wellness. We don't do enough of this. Um, it, it, it focuses on healing the human relationship with the earth. Some people would call it deep ecology. We use eco-psychology only because um, I, think, I think it's more um, understandable to some people. I mean, deep ecology may not mean anything, but eco-psychology, when you start talking about how our own well-being is so um, connected with our environment and the environment is connected with our well-being, meaning there's no, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of circular. It doesn't, there's no separation between the two. So, we so heal ourselves while we heal the earth and we heal the earth while we heal ourselves. So, so Nareen, to contextualize this for, for this group, uh, we've had presentations on positive psychology here before. Um, and uh, in fact, we have quite a number of people who are deeply involved in positive psychology in, mm -hmm. in, in our group. How do you characterize the difference between positive psychology and eco-psychology? Um, that's a good question. So I'm not sure if positive psychology will always be talking about our environment, but it, please, if anyone wants to correct me, I'm happy to hear it. I think eco-psychology is absolutely about how our own well-being is not separate from the well-being of, of our natural surroundings and vice versa, meaning the, the, that interconnection needs also to be understood. So positive psychology, to my understanding, is um, uh, so. So does someone want to take that? Maybe someone who know, who knows it better. I mean, I, I know about positive psychology, but I'm sure some people here. Have I, I can give you my working definition. So my working definition is um, it, it's the same as the difference between uh, uh, environmental and natural resource economists and uh, ecological economists. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, positive psychologists um, understand that when you, uh, that people get better in hospitals when there's a tree outside the window. Right. And the, their, their theorization, how, they, they recognize that that is a real result. Yeah. Um, and, and therefore there is some interactions psychologically between the environment and uh, people. However, they, their theoretical framework does not admit the environment. So they don't know why it happens. Mm. Whereas an eco-psychologist starts from the perspective that the mind is in the environment as it's starting with just as the way that an ecological economist starts with the idea that the economy is fundamentally in the environment right. uh, and that all theory must be developed from that perspective. So that's my working definition of the difference. I like that. I can certainly accept that. Um, I also think that there's a level, uh, it's a fractal level. It's a hologram. We, are, um, we humans reflect or, or our own well-being is... Clearly, when our environment is not healthy, we are not healthy. And when we are not healthy, our environment is not healthy, meaning there, there's, again, that's that interbeing. We are not separate from our environment. So it's not just about our healing, whereas maybe what you're describing about positive psychology and that tree outside the window, say, so, oh, good, we can get better that way. But we, <laughs> we are so inseparable from, from from the rest, of, from the web of life, that the the health and well-being of of our planet is um, cannot be separated out from our own health and meaning. There, there, it's circular again. It's it's it's. Um, it, it's the, the um, so, so an eco psychologist um, uh, uh, not only understands why you get better in or, or is attempting to understand why you get better in a hospital room with a tree outside it. Um, they're actually not surprised. Right. 
but it's also about the tree. It's not just about yeah. the human. That's what I'm yeah, trying yes. to say. Correct, 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 yes. Right, right. And uh, we, we sometimes forget that. That is always my uh, little bit of a quibble with biomimicry is that um, we learn from nature, but it becomes another exploitation of nature rather than learning from nature in order to heal nature. So, um, so my, my program or the program that we're launching here is all about healing the earth. We heal ourselves through healing the earth. So we need to be focused on healing the earth. Um, and that, that really has to be our main focus um, in all of, I think, in our educational system at this moment. I think that that is crucial because I don't think we can be well without it. So these are my, the next one is regenerative practices. So these are very, uh, and I only, I, again, these are not an exhaustive list whatsoever, but we talked about watersheds and I love that you brought that in, Anthony, but um, healing a watershed and it's interesting, I have the people coming in who talk about each of these. I, I have guest speakers who come in and some, uh, I have two other faculty members who come in because this is their expertise. So um, we've removed, in Cleveland, in the, air, in the Cleveland area, we've removed dams and seen how um, the rivers have come back to life. And that is something that uh, we talk about in water and watersheds, ecosystem services, natural resource preservation, food justice, food sovereignty. I think it's crucial right now that we should be working towards, again, localized food, you know, food autonomy. It, Northeast Ohio is absolutely terrible in food autonomy. Um, our food is all trucked in, all imported from outside. I think that if that if the uh, the roads or something were to happen with that, we would be starving within weeks, the entire area. And I think we need to have an understanding of that. Um, urban agriculture is growing, so that's a positive. These are all um, topics that some, I'm hoping that um, my, my participants as they come in might um, choose an area, one of these areas to put their energies into. Um, it could be green building, it could be land preservation, it could be advocacy and activism. I mean, that's also a regenerative practice. Renewable energy, it could be any of these things, and I am certainly not the one to, um, to dictate to anyone who comes into the program which of these um, or, or any other uh, particular practice they want to take on. But what, what happened was that when I was teaching at uh, the college, when I was uh, teaching in the business school, um, I would bring in, I would teach some of the ecological economics and then people would, the students would come to me and say, well, now that we, we've learned this, what do we do with it? What, what's next? How do I make a contribution? So here is where, um, again, it's not my job, and that's something that's taken me a while to, to actually learn this, it's not my job to tell anyone what they need to do. That's again, that's maybe the older system of university education. Uh, although of course, even within, within the university system, everyone chooses which uh, degrees they want or which programs they want. But, um, but I can certainly uh, give at least an array of understanding so that they might find, it's really about helping participants find that sacred purpose what it is that they want to do, what is their contribution to healing the earth. And it could be in one of these areas. So my job is just to bring in people who are working in these areas to, um, to expose all of us to, to the work that's being done. There's some fa fantastic work being done everywhere, not just of course in Northeast Ohio, everywhere around the world. But I, I do think it's important for all of us to be talking about our own regions so I think education needs to be regional, local, and um, and then beyond that, you know, we, we learn from each other. We 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 certainly. Um, um, what you're, we are, you're, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say you're reminding me, Nareed, that um, uh, Alan Tainter and Hoekstra, in their brilliant book Supply Side Sustainability, from nearly twenty years ago now, defined management. Um, that they, they ask the question, if, if an applied physicist is a civil engineer mm -hmm. and an applied chemist is a chemical engineer and an applied biologist is a biological engineer, what's an applied ecologist called? Hmm. And their answer to that was a manager. Mm -hmm. 
And I thought that that was a brilliant reframing of our current understanding. And then they, in that book, they actually went on and provided uh, three or four pieces of advice to managers uh, as to how to leverage the fact that the sun is the source of all the energy, i.e. it's the supply side for sustaining us. Um, so uh, I, it just occurred to me that that's, uh, uh, what, what you're talking about here is the curriculum for yeah. management as applied ecology. Oh, nice, nice. It's nice. Yeah, I should look that up. I'm not familiar with that. And, I, and I'm just sharing in the chat uh, my, my list of the topics uh, that I think need to be in the curriculum. Great, great. And please do, if anyone has any other thoughts, um, I am more than, like I said, I'm more than happy I'm not, uh, I don't pretend to have any definitive or final answers here. But these are some of the topics that, um, that at least I'm bringing into this, to this program that, I'm, that we're creating here. And finally, the eco-entrepreneurship. So eco-entrepreneurship, if you ask um, someone in the field of entrepreneurship, they'll talk about it as a, um, a um, eco-entrepreneurship that's focused on business models that address environmental concerns, right? Profitable green practices. But just as we saw with George Monbiot, I, I think it really goes well beyond that. I think uh, what we are, how we are defining eco-entrepreneurship is any venture, innovation, endeavor, method of organizing it could be a business it could be a nonprofit. it could be a side hustle it could be a gig it could be anything at all i have people who come into our um to our programs who want to plant trees and i have people who come into programs who want to start businesses and anything in between um it's it, it, we sometimes call it finding your tree um which comes from that uh the woman who stayed in the tree for for what was it a whole year so that they wouldn't cut it down and she wrote a book called Find Your Tree. Find the one thing that you're, you know, you're willing to, to commit to, to really um, you know, commit your life to. So that's really, it's really helping people. But then, it, but this is where we get practical with the regenerative practices. So let's say someone finds something that they really want to do. And I have, uh, I have folks coming into the program who already know what they want to do. I have one young woman who wants to, um, bring, um, she wants to set up a kind of business where um, local stay-at-home mothers or fathers can sell food to their neighbors in a community kind of way directly from farmers. Um, she says it could be cheaper than, you know, going to organic, you know, you go to Whole Foods and you get, uh, you may get organic food, but you don't get local food. So it's a way to get a local, uh, potentially also organic food directly from, you know, bypassing the, the, um, the middleman, the supermarkets. Um, so that's her, her goal. That's what sh her dream is to do that and to find a way to make money doing that. Where someone else is coming in and saying, you know, she's just interested in, um, in connect reconnecting more deeply to the natural world. So I don't know what her project is going to be, but, uh, and I have plenty of people who come in and don't know, have no clue what their project is going to be. So, um, but I'm committed to helping them find a project, to actually find something that's practical, that is healing to the earth. And that's, uh, that's what the program is for. I don't know how it's gonna work out, we'll see. I, I have had, uh, we had a graduate of our program who went into, um, who became uh, an eco-psychologist at one of the hospitals in Cleveland, the University Hospital, which is a big hospital system. Um, so it could be really anything. It could be finding a job or it could be building a business or a nonprofit or anything at all. So I don't have, um, I, I don't have an agenda here. I want each, each person to find what they want to do. But the, I guess the, the, the one agenda is that it, it needs to be healing but that could be defined in a lot of different ways. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so like I said, um, it's not just about what we're teaching or the topics we're teaching, it's also very much about how you teach methods. So we do a lot of sitting in circles. We, we teach sitting in circles because again, it's, it's about erasing those hierarchies and figuring out that the knowledge very often is is always in the room. It's not always in the in the in the professor, um, and each then cohort becomes very different, 
and and it's it's fascinating to watch because uh, it's whoever shows up is is going to change the the entire. I mean, the each year will be very different depending on the cohort that is there. But we also want, we've now run um, two years of eco-psychology. So our first programs were all eco-psychology, whereas this year is the first year we're doing ecological leadership, which expands eco-psychology to the other topics that I was just talking about. So we have um, the, the previous two cohorts who are eco-psychology graduates now, we, we've given them a certificate from our own institute in eco-psychology. They are now coming in to be mentors to the new cohort. And that's what I want to see happen is that the, the community keeps growing because it is all about creating community. Um, we use dialogue, nonviolent communication as learning methods. We spend as much time as possible outdoors because we do believe that that, that also changes the way we, we learn and what we're learning and how we learn. Um, obviously not in all weather. So sometimes we go out, um, we do it more, but that's why we're starting in the spring because the summer, so summer months are, are where we focus more on the outdoors. Um, but we try to do it even in the, uh, we do a little bit of that even in the winter months. Um, so yeah, learning outcomes. I mean, that's a question for higher education. What is a learning outcome and what are the right learning outcomes for this kind of a program? So I just threw up some of these. I, ha I have a whole list of them, but yeah, the understanding, I do want people to come away understanding that we're all interconnected and that we're creating community together. Um, we also very much need to be talking about the, um, the grief that we're feeling. And I think that we don't acknowledge this very often. We, we, I, I know it's certainly in, the, um, in a typical university classroom, no one ever talks about grieving. And yet as, species go extinct as we, we feel it in our bodies, as um, the oceans are, are you know, the, the rivers uh, are, are not, everything is, I mean, our, our, our world is dying and we need to grieve together and celebrate, celebrate the beauty, of course, that we still see. I mean, I think that that is... <laughs> N Narita, I'll, I just wanted to add um, uh, that... Um, I was reminded about a, a, year, a little less than a year ago by Joe Brewer, who's unfortunately not able to be here today. He sends his apologies, by the way. He had a prior commitment. To, Joe is um, leading the uh, education blueprint for the R3 uh, 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 initiative of members of the group. Um, it's much bigger than just the initiatives of the members of this group, but that's one way of looking at what they do. Um, and um, it was Joe actually at, at the application partners meeting the R, at the R3 conference in Rotterdam last June, who reminded us of this exact point and um, referenced very usefully um, the work of Gianna Macy, uh, uh, known as the, the, the work that reconnects. Right. About how does one mentally uh, retain hope um, in the situation that we're facing and, and not burn out? Right. And um, th this is a very serious issue for many of us. And, um, one of the things that she acknowledges is that we're living in, and, and Joe reminded us of this, of, reminded us of this, that we're living in a time where something is dying. Yeah. That the, the the very way that we have been brought up is dying, and and so there is a grieving process there, uh, which we need to acknowledge right. uh, because it's going away. Whether it's going away to something better or something worse, that's the choice. But it is going away. Yeah. And so we have deep attachments to it, um, both practical and psychological. Uh, and so we shouldn't be surprised or, nor afraid to grieve. But at the same time, there's something waiting to be born or something being born. Um, and to your point, that's absolutely worth celebrating. Yeah. Um, and that's the hopeful piece. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a little kindled, it's a little spark right now. It needs to be uh, fanned into a into a flame. That's not such a good analogy, but <laughs> that's the one that came to mind. Anyway, Joanna Macy, the work that reconnects. If anybody uh, hasn't uh, read Joanna Macy, uh, well worth it. Yes, we are very inspired by Joanna Macy and her. She she has an exercise called a truth mandala, where we are um, able to express our anger, our grief, our, our our anger, our sadness, our fear, and our hope. And we absolutely. Um, Yes, do those kind of ceremonies together. I think ceremony is important. It's so been cu cut out of any kind of education um, uh, frameworks that we have today. And even 
uh, yeah, I mean, every death is also a rebirth, and we do need to recognize that. And I like what you just said, Anthony, that it's also about um, the grieving and celebrating are both correct and both. Right. Well, the celebrating could be only that we're, we're getting together, that we are forming that circle together is also a celebration. Um, the grief and the celebration are almost, again, mixed. You, you can't separate them out right now, not in this current time where we are. Um, but I sometimes go into, when I go into a, a university or, a, a, you know, a, a regular university classroom, I, I can sense it. I can feel the energy of the students who are, they're, they're, they're so earnest. They're so trying hard to, to conform to what they're told that they must do. And yet the grief is palpable and it's not being expressed. It's not being talked about. We don't give it any um, air time. And I, I just feel that maybe that is the most important thing we can do is to, to recognize that, you, you, like you say, Anthony, it's not only our natural world that's dying, but it's also our civilization that's dying. And, and our culture is dying. Um, it's certainly going to change and morph into something else. And we need to recognize that and acknowledge that. Um, we're living in very turbulent times. And if we go on pretending that it's not, it's almost like we're all... It, there's a lack of recognition of what, what is really happening together. And it's almost like um, it's gaslighting. It almost makes you go crazy a little bit thinking that, um, that we're acting normally and yet we all know that something is not normal anymore, that the, whatever the normal is, is not there anymore. Um, I call it re-indigenizing Western minds, which may be a little bit, uh, I've had this ongoing conversation with my two sons who don't like me using the word re indigenous or indigenizing. But um, I like to, I still use it, I still insist on using it because uh, it's, it's not exactly going back to indigenous or something that may have been an ancient indigenous practices, but it's a re-indigenizing, it's taking Western minds, because we're gonna be doing it differently. Whatever our celebration, whatever our ceremonies are, yes, we can learn from the indigenous people and we should, and yet it's going to look differently. So it's, um, it's gonna look different from what, what we, uh, you know, what, what's gone before. And it's something that we're creating as we go along. And um, as we say with the eco-psych practice or the deep ecology practices, we need to listen to the earth and what the earth wants us to be doing. And we get answers when we listen. We absolutely do get answers about that. So that's why I call it re-indigenizing and apologies to anyone who might take offense um, by me using that uh, word. I, 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 we have um, uh, a, a few uh, Canadian First Nations people in our community. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they've repeatedly stressed uh, to us is that um, they don't want, when I say we, I'm referring now to settlers and those in, in the, who, who come from that culture. Um, and uh, which would be the majority of us on the call here today. And they've said to us, we don't want you to become us. Yeah. We don't want you to become, um, you know, North American First Nations, people like that who, who have their worldview. Right. However, what they are saying to us is we've got to go and rediscover our own indigeneity. Right. Because guess what? We did at one time have this connection with the land and you've mentioned, you know, actually in Western civilization, as I've started to realize, it goes back way before the Enlightenment, uh, the, the roots of it. Uh, but the Enlightenment certainly gave it a kick in the pants in this direction. And um, we've really got to go back and, and not to say we have to go back to that lifestyle or that way of being, but the, the recognition of our relationship uh, to each other and, the, and the, the environment is definitely something we have to reconnect to. So one of the things I've, I've said in the, uh, in the chart that I just shared about uh, the, the set of knowledge that's required is that, um, yes, we have to use the best available uh, science that we can get a hold of and uh, all of the moral and ethical frameworks uh, that we've developed uh, over the years. Um, but we also have to employ deep indigenous wisdom is the way I refer to it. Um, and, and that's not referring specifically to any one indigenous peoples. It's everybody's indigenous knowledge. And we all have it. It's just that in our culture, we've forgotten it. Right. Um, there was a, I just, sorry, a little, a little sidebar here. There was a fascinating short article in the New Scientist uh, last week um, that 
the, uh, when the last ice age ended and the sea levels rose by, I can't remember how many meters it was, but it was, it was 20 or 30 meters. So it really changed coastlines. Um, there are stories that the Australian Aborigines are still telling each other about that set of events um, and, and what they did in response. So it, it, we just have to find out how do we reclaim that knowledge that's ours by our birthright. Yeah. Know how. yeah. I, I love what you're saying. And it is about telling stories and there are new stories to tell now. And there's stories that the land wants us to tell now. And we have to listen to tell those stories. Um, and that is a re-indigenizing to me, at least. Um, it's listening to the land and then telling stories around it. And, and you know, we learn by sitting in that circle and maybe um, actually having a fire ceremony at night or on the equinox or, or the solstices. And we learn together by, um, um, there, there's so many ways to do ceremony. We have to do new ceremonies, not to do the same ceremonies that were done, you know, by whoever was there before us, but to, to create the new ones, because that's, I think, what we're being called upon to do today. Um, we're, we're, we're very much in the dark. That's why this the entire, like the program I say is not, this is not set in stone. This is about figuring it out together. It's co-creating and we are absolutely co-creating with the participants, all the participants together are co-creating as long as, um, so I feel my job is to hold that container and then allow whatever needs to emerge, emerge. I don't always know what's going to happen. And it's a little bit of, um, it's a leap for those of us who are used to being, you know, in control of a classroom and we know what we're doing and we know what the, you know, the, we have a syllabus and we're following it and we, we, we know what material we need to cover, but we don't know what material we need to cover anymore. We need to kind of, uh, figure it out as we're going along in community. So it's very different from any, uh, you know, traditional kind of classroom. Um, and it's, it's um, there's a lot of uncertainty. It, it's not an easy thing to do. It's a little frightening, but I think that to be transparent about that also helps to, to, uh, to, to out ourselves as, hey, we're figuring this out together. Um, so, Nareen, we have about, uh, if, if we keep going for the 10 minutes that we were delayed at the start, if, if people are comfortable with that. Oh, are we almost finished? I, I'm actually almost finished. Let we've, me. We've got yeah. about 20 minutes left, so I just wanted to give you that time, Mark, so we could have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you for that timing. So, I will, I'll just finish up. Finish up. So, like I, I said before, um, teaching methods that emphasize interconnection, um, so, and I think I already spoke about this one, the facilitator's role is being holding the container rather than uh, being the one with all the knowledge. Um, and I can move forward. Uh, grades is a big question, actually. And um, this is one that um, I, I know from, <laughs> from the past that you could actually talk a whole hour and a half just about this. How do you evaluate? How do you evaluate how do you know you're running a quality program? How do you measure what students have learned? Do we need to measure what students have learned? Um, do we even need to evaluate students? Uh, what are our measurements? So this is something that I'm going to leave as a question because, like I said, it can be, um, there's a lot to this. Um, and I, I'm not sure what the right answer is. I do know that I am not going to give grades. <laughs> I don't know exactly then how you how to evaluate except to see if there's if, so the what I've been what I've suggested that we do and what we're going to do this for this program that's like I said launching in March is the product call it that is a um, something called a not a, so I took business plan but since we're not creating businesses, we're doing a life plan for healing the earth and each person has it. It has to be a living document that actually makes sense to each person. So I think the success is, or that, you know, measure of success is if the document is useful to each and every person who comes out and becomes something that they can use as a way of guiding them, getting themselves um, forward. Um, but I'm open to any other suggestions. I don't know exactly how to do this and whether it becomes a problem or not that we don't have grades. We'll see. The, the um, environmental studies program that I took was very interesting as far as grades was concerned because um, they recognized that we need to get 
we need to be encouraged to learn things outside of our fields right. of expertise. And right. so, you know, one, one of the classic choices students have to make is if they want to pass their degree, they tend to pick the courses that they know they're going to succeed in. And yeah. so that actually mitigates against them taking courses about topics that they might be interested in or that could be useful, but they fear taking them for, for quote, failing. And so what they did is they, they simply had a, um, a satisfactory, not satisfactory grading system. And um, it was basically a judgment call by the professor as to what grade you got. Um, you know, had you done what it was necessary? And, and obviously they make it clear what satisfactory looks like at the beginning of the course. So you had, you had an expert expectation, but it was definitely, um, you know, the, 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 the professor could take into account somebody's background when they were able to say that you had done satisfactorily or not, for example. It's very interesting, and it's actually going to be more of a challenge for me, and I know that because, so I, I give assignments occasionally, they have to read something or, or write something, and yet if there's no grade that I can hold over their heads, what is, uh, what, what happens if they don't do it? What happens if they don't uh, fulfill the requirements? Um, so at the end, they get a certificate from Lake Erie Institute, but um, am I really going to withhold that certificate? I mean, what if, some, if someone, I guess, doesn't do any of the assignments? And yes, but they expect to get that certificate. So is that the only thing I have? I mean, usually, obviously, with, with students in your university system, they say, well, if you don't do it, you get a lower grade, right? Um, I'm not sure how that's going to work. <laughs> um, we are so used to having that extrinsic reward rather than, um, you know, the knowledge that we're just learning for its own sake that I, I don't know. And I know it's a, it's a problem because we have had students who then don't fulfill the, you know, the assignments. Um, we'll see. <laughs> uh, we'll, I'll figure it out as, as we're going along. We'll see if we can shift enough to, to make it that everybody does take enough pride in what they're doing to, to want to um, make the commitment. But we'll see how that goes. Um, Sorry, if I can jump yeah. in. I went to, um, I took a fine arts undergrad, and uh, so they faced this uh, problem as well about, hey, art is subjective. Um, the design courses uh, stuck to letter grades, uh, but the art courses, um, similar to Anthony, what you had, uh, but actually uh, they had three levels, like unsatisfactory, pass, and high pass. And I think the high pass part came in um, because um, administrators or even like graduates of the program where they, you know, happily gone in to that system, then were applying to grad school at other places. And uh, no one knew kind of like how to rank them against their competition getting into whatever next uh, uh, opportunity. Yeah, but I'd share that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting because the moment you start with high pass and pass and then not passing, it, it, you've already set up again a, a system of kind of grading, which um, you just sort of change it from A to B to C to something else. I, I don't know. I, I want to get away from the grading, and yet I also know that that there's a, an incentive to it. It incentivizes people to to actually do the work. So. It's it's a challenge, and I and like I said, it's something you could talk about for a long time because I have had long conversations with folks about it. So um, I I'll move forward from it, but yeah, keep it as an open question. I I don't know exactly what how that's going to work. Um, I want to just say to, as a wrap as a way to wrap up that the, imagining the future in a positive way today is absolutely an act of immense courage, of resistance, and of rebellion. Um, I do believe that this is a time that calls for great visions. Um, our society usually doesn't like visionaries. Um, I, I think <laughs> I, I was going to say something political here about the U.S. elections, but I'll, I'll leave it aside. Um, the, our society tells us to be realistic and not to be visionaries, and I think that's the message we've been getting for a long time. But I am inviting us all here to become visionaries in the way we conceive of, of education. Um, and I think educators are absolutely at, at a ground zero for envisioning a more beautiful future. And I think that's our role. So my final questions, which after asking all these different questions, um, I would like to, my overarching questions are, what if every university declared a climate emergency and all of its courses were taught through that lens? And what if our education system 
was designed to help us create a more beautiful world. And what would that look like? So, um, and with those words, I will end here. And we'd love to hear your, um, your own questions or responses or thoughts or suggestions. So I've been taking uh, moderator's privilege by interrupting the reading several times. But oh, I'm I, happy you did. I, I, will, I will now invite everybody else who's been too shy to do the same to uh, uh, ask some questions. There's been a, 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 quite a few comments in the chat, Marie, oh. uh, which you'll want to take a look at. We'll save the chat to the uh, Google Drive folder as well. Uh, and um, I'm just well, going to... I'll stop the sharing here now. Let me... Let yeah, me go back. Okay. yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but of course. Go ahead, please. Yeah, this is you funny. might introduce yourself. Three players, because the reach Greek should know who's us. Okay, uh, I'm Bob Willard, and um, I'm familiar with a couple of things that have some elements in common with what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bainbridge Graduate Institute and the Presidio, where MBA programs started from the ground up, uh, trying to accomplish a lot of what you are trying to accomplish to prepare uh, leaders, especially business leaders. Um, with a much more holistic view, system view, of um, what we need to be able to uh, pay attention to and do something about in the future. So some of the elements that you described uh, are very, very similar to the Bainbridge Graduate Institute elements, and um, I hope that you're in dialogue with them because I think there could be some, some good learning on both sides. There's also something called the Academy for Sustainable Innovation, ASI, which has been started up by David Wheeler here in Canada. And he's trying to train quite a number of um, transition professionals, 100,000 transition professionals to get us from where we are today, transitioning to a, a low carbon and a circular economy. Uh, so his background is in the MBA world. Uh, he was a um, uh, chair of the sustainability focus for the Schulich School of Business at York University. He went to Dalhousie and uh, was dean of business there. He went over to Dartmouth um, University in the UK, was chancellor of Cape Breton University. And uh, he is very uneasy slash disgusted uh, with the way in which MBA programs are trying to pre prepare business leaders for the 21st century. He thinks they're totally yeah. missing the mark. They are, they, they absolutely are. I, I can say. What's the name of the person you're mentioning here? I, I didn't get the name. Wheeler. Uh, I'll put it in the chat. I'll put it. Okay. H-E-E-L-E-R. Um, so he has put together a set of competencies that he thinks leaders of the future need to be able to meet. Uh, and he's looking around for, for programs, courses, um, micro credits that help people um, pick up those, those skills. So there are, there are some things going on that are trying to do sort of what you're trying to do, which is to acknowledge, first of all, that the historic way in which we prepared business leaders isn't cutting it anymore yeah. uh, and providing alternative approaches. The challenge, of course, is the credentialism associated with whatever they leave with, which ties back to your grading and other uh, certificate things and so on. Right. Um, and that, that's a dilemma. Yeah. Uh, so when the practicality of what it is that we're trying to help students pick up and, and learn um, starts to come into question. There really is a challenge to figure out how the heck we can help them do well um, by doing good and um, how we can contribute to the SDGs, which are a pretty good blueprint for where we want to get to as a society um, in a constructive way and, and um, be able to uh, add value in a way that allows us to have a good standard of living as well. So it's a lot of a lot of initiatives that are are somewhat in common with yours that are really exciting as well, and it's good to hear about yours as well. 
Great, thank you for that. I, I think that there's, um, it's gonna take a lot of us doing it differently. Uh, and, and, you know, um, we'll be figuring out different solutions or different possibilities. I don't wanna call it a solution. And, and I think that every, I think that it's very local, meaning I think that regionally that there will be different answers, different responses to the question of what we need to be teaching, what we need to be learning. The, uh, the question of credentialing is very interesting. And of course, at first I wanted to get credential, meaning I was looking for a, an institution that would take us under their wing and provide for us accreditation. And then I realized that, um, firstly, the students didn't care. <laughs> The, the people who were making the inquiries didn't really care. Um, and also, again, it would, it would slow us down. And we are very young and very nimble because we're, we're a new um, nonprofit and it may change. And I know that I recognize that as you become more institutionalized, it, you know, things change. Well, what do you do about grades? Someone here asked, what, what do you need them for? Um, I don't know, what do you need grades for? But like I said, as a university professor, I know that very often in the past students don't do the assignments unless they're getting a grade. So I'm not sure. I'm not, I mean, maybe that's the only reason you need a grade is a kind of like a hammer or, or you know, the, the stick to hold over the students, but hopefully we don't, we won't need that. Hopefully people will be, um, you know, motivated themselves to, to actually complete the work. Um, I think one of the challenges that's, uh, I, this, I experienced this myself personally in universities when I realized how subjective yeah. the education system was, was I was taking um, two Canadian history courses and they had a paper that overlapped exactly. And I wrote mm -hmm. a paper, one paper for both courses. And one professor failed me and one professor passed me. And they both had very, very, very different reasons for doing that mm -hmm. uh, in terms of um, the, the subjectivity of what they personally were looking for versus the content that the, that the question was asking. And um, the idea that you, you giving a grade yeah. um, isn't relative to any other person that would be giving that grade necessarily. There's not, I don't know if there's a way to figure that out. Maybe mathematics as an example, where there is a answer. Yeah. But until we can figure out how, how, how um, people measure um, uh, objectively a, a grade, um, because when I was in university, I realized that I was learning a lot that I wasn't getting graded on. And right. that isn't taken into any consideration for through my marks. I use, the, I use that knowledge and that wisdom that I'd accumulated over the years that came out of my education. But I don't, uh, the grade that I got and the, and the scores that I got in education are 1000% irrelevant to yeah. who I am today. Yeah, and, and like I said, the, the question of grades, it becomes, everybody has um, something to, to contribute here, whether you're on one side as a professor or as a student or both, because we, most of us have been both. Um, yeah, it is absolutely subjective. I mean, grading is subjective. And uh, what I've done in my university classroom, which of course I, is not condoned by the deans, but uh, I, I, my last few times that I have taught within the university, I've pretty much said to the students, you decide on your own grade. Um, and of course, it, it, it creates an incredible amount of chaos. And you know, what do you mean? You want us to give a grade to ourselves? How can we possibly do that? But I found that they actually are very honest. They, they become, you know, students actually did not all give themselves an A. A lot of them did. <laughs> the men do more than the women. <laughs> um, but I, you know, it, it, I, when I recognize how subjective it is, and I'm giving it based on a lot of times, based on my relationship with the student, you know, if a student came and talked to me and, uh, you know, ha or had interaction with me, I tended to give them a better grade. That's a subjective thing. Um, so, so the, yeah, I mean, I, it, the grading is an interesting topic. Go ahead. So, so we're, we're just coming towards the end. And um, uh, but for this meeting, because we know we have so many members interested in this topic of, of education, and Michael Cillion in Sweden has just shared a link to uh, uh, an article he's written about this topic mm. uh, in the chat as, as just another illustration of somebody else interested in this topic uh, who's part of our community. Um, and, and we, we have, uh, I know we've let, we let a number of directors of, uh, of sustainable management courses know about today's meeting. So. Uh, and then a number of them have, have said that they either were on the call earlier and couldn't stay uh, or have told us they'll be watching the presentation afterwards. So um, as, we, as we conclude, 
Um, given, as you've observed, there is so much still to be done in this field, um, what would we as a community uh, like to, to do about this important topic? Um, and just as, a, as an illustration, uh, when this question has been asked on other topics like measurement, for example, uh, or tools, as another example, or methods, as another example, um, members have got together in interesting and very varied ways to start initiatives, and you can see those listed on our uh, wiki page, which we're working on updating at the moment. So I'll, I'll just open the floor, um, and Nareen, maybe I'll ask you to start. Uh, what would you like to see here? How, how, could, how can this community help, support, accelerate? How, how can working together, how can cooperating to put up one of your, to, to, lead, to actually you apply one of your assumptions, how, how could we do that? Um, well, what would help for me, so here, here I am kind of, um, I, 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 I would love some collaboration on it. I would love for someone to, um, to help me with these questions and, you know, even to examine the, the answers that I may have come up with and they're not final answers, like I've said, uh, would love to kind of brainstorm it and see what other possible ways. And what am I missing? I, I have a feeling because I'm only one person, we're, we're not, we're, we're a group of people, but, um, but this particular program I'm leading, um, I'm sure that there are things that I'm not thinking of, meaning that maybe um, I should, it, it would help me shift this program. So I would love to, to get more perspectives on it. So that's, that's just what I'm thinking right now. Vlad, I know you're in the education space. What's your uh, reflection on this? Um, yeah, I think, I think definitely having uh, this type of collaborative dialogue helps and sharing practices, for example, um, some of the things that you mentioned, Narette, in terms of, uh, in terms of indigenizing um, or re-indigenizing uh, education, I think are practices that are rare and also hard to put in practice in the classroom. And so being able as educators to share how to do that, I think is, is, a, is a fantastic start. So I think each of us bringing that into our classrooms is, um, I guess, the, you know, the very beginnings of that. And then from there on, creating um, a larger collaboration would be, I think, I think the goal. Um, I'm not sure what the vision of that uh, would look like, but very, very excited to uh, be part of it somehow, yeah. It takes a lot of courage to break out of, to actually do something there. I, I once brought into the university classroom, and again, not, I'm not talking about my program here, um, a truth mandala. I did it. I actually brought in, so Joanna Macy, when she, there are instructions online if you ever want to do this, because our, um, the, the course itself lends itself to this, but we, I brought in leaves, um, leaves mean symbolizing sadness, a stick, which symbolizes anger. Um, what was it that symbolized fear? I think a rock symbolized fear. And then there was a, a bowl, an empty bowl that symbolizes hope. And, and I actually set it up in the middle of a classroom and we, we, we conducted a ceremony like that. But I was thinking like, that that's, takes a lot of courage to do. That's not something that's generally done. I mean, let, let's be honest, we, we don't do things like that usually as instructors in, in, a, in a classroom. Um, I, I think it's supporting each other to do things like that. I mean, you need, kind of need your own community to say, hey, yeah, dare do it. I used to start, and it wasn't every class I could do this, but for a while I, I dared, I took a chance and I, I started each class with a, a two minute meditation. Um, and I had the feedback at the end of the, of the, from the students was, well, at first I thought it was a stupid thing to do. Why were we doing this? But by the end of it, I really looked forward to that two minutes of meditation, but it took courage to do it. At first I was like, oh my God, what are they gonna think of me if I do this? Um, it changed the class. I mean, it really, I, I really believe that we went much deeper than we would have without that two minute meditation. And I would do check-ins. I would have, you know, go around, how are, where, what are you coming in with? Who are you? What, and again, you can't do that with a very large class, but you can do that with, depending on a certain number. Um, if we can push even that a little bit within the university, we may be already making 
big inroads that, that you know, re-indigenizing. I mean, uh, th these are things that you do, you, you pass a talking stick, right? Uh, we don't have to do it exactly that way, but there are ways to do it. So supporting each other on that is important. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree that it's, I think it's, I think it's at times um, breaking out of that you know that that paradigm is it does take courage yeah especially when you are centered in an, in an institution that doesn't understand those principles i think and i think i think you become a bit of you know that rogue um instructor at that point and 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 the fear is well you know is this is this uh, acceptable as according to the curriculum but then as you said education is very much subjectively, um, I mean, we were talking about grades, but I think as a whole education is subjectively created in terms of what, you know, what, what we believe knowledge is and how it's acquired and how to measure it. Yeah. And so I think, uh, I think being that, that, that rogue instructor at times is, is really interesting. Some, so some of the practices that I've, that I've used are similar to, to ones you've said, for example, active listening. So instead of meditation start, beginning with this kind of uh, sharing between two. So mm -hmm. having the same partner between students and them, them sharing where they're at at the beginning of the class for five minutes and the other listening um, or nonviolent communication, another great practice that, uh, that, that, that I think has, has worked well in the classroom. Um, uh, in integrative seminars, so kind of that check-in, but with the whole group where, you know, it's sitting around a circle, everyone's able to bring to the table mm -hmm. How they feel not only about the content and the theory but but as a whole about where they're at in their life where they're at in this classroom how the content merges with or um, embeds with their personal lives and, yeah. and so that and and the students have oftentimes i've found taken positively to these types of alternative methods um and and so i think i i think especially with the new generation they are apt and and willing to do that as long as there is uh, a context provided for them and explained right dialogue so, instead of debate is such a big difference i mean we are so taught debate and like you know that you argue with someone but when the dialogue is of course when you build on the argument you you, you listen to, to what the other person is saying and you build on that and that is a totally different it's not natural in our university settings or in our classroom settings so those are all important, and it is being that rogue professor to do that. So um, I, I'm, we're going to have to draw a, a line under today's wonderful discussion uh, and presentation. So, uh, Narit, thank you again for sharing your current thinking. I, I can definitely see it's evolved at some, somewhat from when you presented in uh, Montreal in August. So thank you for that update. Um, and um, I don't know if Narit or somebody else would like to take on the task of organizing a call. Um, Tim and Laurie, our community animators, can pass on to you all the other people who we invited to be here today and get their email addresses to you uh, so that you could include them. Um, if anybody would like Nareet to connect, with, or would like to be part of this, whoever's going to organize it, uh, perhaps put your, um, uh, at least your names into the chat now. Um, and then we've got a record. I wouldn't put your emails, we'll, we'll figure out how to do that since this file will be in public, um, probably not a good idea to put your email address in there. Um, and uh, we'll figure that, figure that out. So, um, I don't know, I don't want to put you on the spot, Marie, but would you, are you willing to um, organize a call in the next month or so? So, uh, yeah, let me talk, I'll, I'll talk to you offline about what that would look like, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. We can, certainly for these first calls, we can use the Zoom the facility that we have here to, to mm -hmm. just talk to each other so we can figure that out. So yeah, okay, let's, let's uh, chat offline. Um, and uh, so... And thanks uh, for who gave me this list of the meta crisis, the meaning crisis, the cri who, who wrote that's, this? That's my, Michael Sillion, who's uh, yeah. sitting in Amsterdam, Sweden. Uh, rather, rather, well, it's not quite as late as nice as it is normally. <laughs> <laughs> since the time difference is a little bit less at the moment. Um, okay, so to draw a line on today's call, thank you very much again, Nareet. Thank you, everybody, for your uh, questions, comments, uh, and um, uh, discussion. Uh, next month is the 90th meeting, um, and uh, for the first time in a long time, I can't be here. <laughs> so 
So uh, your hosts will be probably Peter Jones uh, from OCAD and uh, uh, Laurie and uh, Tim will be helping out. And the presenters, uh, funnily enough, are a bunch of people from the biomimicry space, uh, both in the United States and here in Canada. Um, there's a journal, those of you who might be interested, Psycho Quarterly, that many of these people are involved in, uh, which is a, a really good uh, journal for um, examples of biomimicry, um, mostly uh, post hoc as usual, but uh, nevertheless pretty interesting. So we'll get a, a biomimicry overview and how that applies to strongly sustainable flourishing business next month. Uh, and I can't remember if we've got anything organized for May yet. No, I don't think so. So we're, we, we have a long list of people we, who we could invite, but we haven't done it yet. So um, with that, I shall uh, draw a line under this. Uh, thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all. Thanks for listening.